if I'm a multifamily investor, what do I want to? So know, I'm mentioning this report, and and I and you'll get these in in like a Globe Street or BizNow, which are publications that often will report on the reports, and uh, sometimes I use them. Yeah, I was that's like, not oh, what we do is it? Uh, no, we offer commentary and intelligence. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> but. I'm telling you, I like this one, and sometimes I like a little bit of what we say because we can point out things, exactly. right, that people aren't noticing. Yeah. Okay. And this yeah. is what Globe Street did. They've got, you know, we've got three decent multifamily reports that came out this week. They all cover the moderation and seasonality that's returning to the apartment market that we didn't see uh, at this time last year. But Globe Globe Street's take on this, it does acknowledge the seasonality angle, but they also, I really liked it because it's a reminder that different cities are experiencing far different rent growth trends right now. And it's worth paying attention to the way these markets are moving right now. Also, like, I also like the idea at the end, they say it specifically like, you got to read different reports. They're going to tell you different things. And um, that, you know, it's, it's, this isn't also, also, this isn't in the Globe Street article specifically. I mentioned this before, but I think that the post pandemic, post 2021 multifamily markets finally coming into focus. We have come out of this hyper growth period of 2021 and and we have also kind of come out of this uncertain period of earlier in the year. Yeah. And we really kind of are in this part part where, yeah, maybe things are moderating or even slightly decelerating, but things are really clear and a little bit more explainable in terms of rent growth and demand um, than, than it was before. You know, it used to be, la you know, last year around this time, we were thinking like, it, it was hard to plan because you don't know. And also the sell, you know, maybe a seller is going to get really excited and expect huge rent growth. You get a huge price. Are you going to overpay and it's it's way hard to make predictions in that in that kind of a market and when i see things are a little more a little more predictable it makes me a little less oh worried. yeah i mean because when you're trying to determine if there's 20 percent rent growth yeah what do you assume the next year or the year after you're not going to assume mm -hmm. 20 percent or, or do you do you do 10 I and mean, 10 is you know more than three times more than your average organic rent growth yeah um so but but three percent isn't the option either. So there's a lot more speculation, um, speculating on events that no one knows the answer of. Mm -hmm. to, to have the right answer, um, you have to know more than you know the, base, the smartest traders and investors in the yeah. world. And people who have way more information than we do. They don't. They don't know where you know where the bond market's going, where the economy is going. Yeah. Um, we can kind of get a, a you know a feeling. I mean, my, my my sense right now is just given more information. You know, we're seeing a deceleration, and again. Um, at really a normalization, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we, we we're going to see uh, maybe a little bit more than half of the rent growth we saw last year. I'm assuming maybe we see half the rent growth next year that we saw this year. Yeah. So you yeah. know, in the five to six percent range, which is still all elevated, and almost double what you'd see on a normal year, mm -hmm. and then you know, probably relatively elevated levels because we'll probably see you know some um, some just tag along inflation, hang hanging on inflation. So maybe we're going to be in the four to five percent range for the next yeah. couple of years, but that's uh there's a much less degree for air if you're in between four and five than if you are in between five and 15. yeah you know uh, that's yeah and that's and that's like uh, all the whole assessment i think we are in a different paradigm in it and you know what i was going to ask you earlier was well how do you make these decisions you know we're we're currently you know pursuing like a number of properties right now yeah. and like we're kind of coming out but there's still so many question marks how do you deal especially when it comes yeah. to like well you don't know what the interest is going to be so why yeah. even buy why why do what we're doing yeah well i think you have to be very like, very selective mm -hmm. you know what we're looking at right now is where can we find value at a good price in places that maybe not everyone else is looking so obviously the midwest is our niche um so some secondary and tertiary markets in the Midwest that, again, don't hit the headlines, um, aren't a part of the normal narrative that everyone's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then finding opportunities to where we can still use positive leverage, which means your cap rate is higher than your interest rate, okay. which the inverse negative leverage, no one ever hardly talked about before, really um, before six months ago, yeah. um, because your interest rate was always lower than your cap rate. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of uh, acquisitions are your cap, your interest rate is higher than your cap rate with the idea you're going to get growth, you're going to grow out of it, and your yield on costs is mm -hmm. going to be more than your interest rate. Um, but that when you're using negative leverage, it's not helping you because your unlevered yield is actually more than your levered yield. Yeah. Um, now it helps obviously how much money you have to bring to the table, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so the couple strategies, one, find that positive leverage. And, you know, mm -hmm. we found a great opportunity in a tertiary market in a great sub market of this market 
um, that maybe not everyone would go to, but it's we know the market, we know it well, we know the sub market, and we're you know we're getting like a five point five five point seven percent cap rate mm-hmm. um, when the, with our in- interest rates um, now are anywhere between kind of five and five and you know five and five point four right now, and at least using like a fixed rate based on the ten year treasury, um, we still have positive leverage there. Um, another strategy that this isn't just something you can do, it takes more work, but finding opportunities with, um, existing assumable loans. So we actually have two, oh. two, um, opportunities in our pipeline where we'll be assuming the loan. It was taken out, uh, agency loans, um, with 10 year terms they were taken out three years ago at a higher load and value. I think originally they were at kind of in the 75, 70, 75 to 80%. LTV range. Mm-hmm. So today, the way we're purchasing them, they'll be right at 65% LTV, which isn't about the range that a new loan would be today, yeah. given the rates in the market. But the interest rate we're assuming is a 3.4% interest rate. Again, if we went out to the market today to get us the same loan, well, it, you'd be paying a five to again, five and a half percent yeah. interest rate. So we're, we're saving up to 200 basis points on the rate. And that is, that is huge. So that allows us to, you know, these are like a class, nice assets. Mm -hmm. So that allows us to buy still with positive, positive leverage. Like these deals still are kind of like mid, uh, mid high 4% cap rates, but our, our interest rates only uh, 3.4. So we've got positive leverage. Um, so you have to be more discriminating, um, and you have to find these unique opportunities. It takes a lot more time. I mean, we, we, I went through our acquisition pipeline for the year. We've underwritten like 150 deals um, to just to find a handful that actually um, work. Yeah. Um, another thing, though, I wish that was yeah. spread out over the time rather than I all know. at once. <laughs> I, that would be that would be something. Um, another piece is I think the strategies have changed, and where value add isn't as um, isn't the same as yeah. it was a couple of years ago. Um, you have costs that have gone up considerably. You have a struggle uh, finding the labor or the contractors to get the work done. Um, but at organic growth being at what it is, um, you, the ROI of a value add renovation where you're going to put a lot of money into a unit for a rent bump, the ROI is is not nearly as attractive compared to some of the organic growth that you can get with doing much less. Because mm-hmm. if you're, let's, for example, and this is a real example, we have a property up in Michigan where are the least trade outs we're getting $150 uh, more in rent. Hmm. Our pro forma was to go in and renovate the units to get a $200, $250 premium after the renovation, after spending about $7,500. So do you spend $7,500 to get an additional, uh, to get, Two hundred dollars a month, or spend almost nothing, clean it up, yeah, and get one hundred fifty dollars. I mean, there are. I mean, let's say you're spending a thousand to get the one fifty, just a little bit of cleanup, or twenty five hundred. Yeah, divide that by the one fifty times twelve. Yeah, versus having to spend seventy five hundred dollars divided by the 200, 250. Yeah. The ROI is just not there. So it's much more efficient because you're getting so much rent growth with just doing less. Mm-hmm. So you're going to work a lot harder, spend a lot more money, might not get it done on time. And yeah. you're only going to force so much appreciation. And there's a lot more moving parts and risk associated with those projects. Like we can we can do those and we have value add projects that we're in the middle of. Mm-hmm. But on new acquisitions, you know, we're saying, hey, what's, what's a quality asset in a good location that we can buy at an attractive price basis because there aren't as many buyers so like you can find some unique opportunities so value we, add product projects are a little bit more competitive for among buyers no um not necessarily okay. not, not i mean i think there's others that are going towards value as well yeah um but they the value just they're not as I, there's a lot of honestly there's a lot of value add deals that aren't even trading right now hmm. because people are looking at valuations um using a you know a four cap um, that may have made sense six months ago, and people are looking at it and they're like, I, I, I'm not even gonna be able to get the work get the work done. Yeah. I'm gonna have to pay up from a '70s vintage asset. Why would I buy you know a '70s deal that I'm gonna need to put a bunch of money in, do a lot of work? I'm not even gonna get the contractors to do the work, and I have to pay a huge premium on that versus buying something that's built relatively recently that I'm gonna get great growth. It's going to be a good location. It's going to be a great property in the next couple of mm-hmm. years. And you're always going to be able to command a premium. Yeah. Um, 
that's where more investors are looking at right now. Hmm. Um, and that's reflected in, you know, some of the surveys we, we've looked at in, in the past several yeah, weeks. that's true. Where um, workforce housing just not, isn't nearly as popular mm-hmm. as it was um, several years ago. Now, that'll, that'll switch at some point. Um, but the other reason is because there's not the – there's not enough wage growth in that kind of bottom quartile in yeah. workforce housing to support much more rent gro- much more rent growth. Yeah. Whereas on the A class, going to be plus through A, a class – you have all these people who like are ma- making good money. They've got good jobs. They were going to buy a house, but they no longer can afford the house. Or they said, they said, oh, well, I'm going to wait for the, mar- the housing market to crash. And so I'm going to rent in the meantime. So we've got all of these mm-hmm. people with good incomes looking for a nice place to live. And they're look- living at these A-class assets. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense, especially, you know, as a real sum result of all the trends that we saw that there is a lot of the trends of 2021 in terms of renter behavior that haven't, haven't gone away. Yeah. Maybe the numbers behind it of, of like, rent, you can't just keep growing, but like the desires and the demands of renters, they're still interested. Like we said, they're still yeah. living in the suburbs. They still kind of want those things. Yeah. 